Hello, I'm Mike Wheeler, and this is Democratic Dialogue. Um, it's been a show that has been on local television, now 1623 television, for more than a decade now. And occasionally I have the fun of talking to people about political issues and uh, areas of concern for all of us. Today we have two guests. We have John Lippitt, who has kindly come down from Reading, and we've got Peter Enrich, who's made an even longer voyage from Lexington. Both of you are associated with Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts. There are so many grassroots organizations that have grown up recently. I was interested, when we talked earlier, your roots go back to 2002? 2002, or that, that, that's right. Yeah, we, we largely grew out of um, a gubernatorial campaign back in 2002 by Bob Reich that some some of your mm -hmm. viewers may remember. And what we realized coming out of that campaign, we realized two things. First thing we realized is there wasn't very much real infrastructure to build progressive power within the Democratic Party in Massachusetts. And second, that the cost of that was that we weren't being very effective. And in that election, there were several progressives running for governor. We ended up with a not very progressive candidate who then proceeded to lose to Mitt Romney. Mm. And coming out of that, we said, what we really need is we need to organize activists around the state, provide them with skills, provide them with connections, and build some real progressive power within the Democratic Party, both to ensure that we elect more progressive candidates and that we advance some progressive issues and that we build a real sense of grassroots power by building relationships, mm -hmm. by training people, by being engaged, by building a community. And that, that's what we've been doing for the last what are we up to? Fifteen years now. And counting. Um, but what's interesting, you know, speaking of counting, uh, you appropriately used the word progressive more than once <laughs> on this. And yet when we were talking before we went on air, John, um, it's interesting that some things that are labeled progressive or left wing or whatever were centrist back in in the 60s so so i wouldn't mind i wouldn't mind if that's where we were to, to today i mean in terms of what the agenda is the the progressive agenda what is it that are the the priorities well i guess we do have a mission statement that just addresses the fact that we're working to promote economic social and environmental justice i don't think those are new things and certainly back in the 60s uh, they were uh, topics of of consideration, and also just um, <clears throat> make sure that our government is a true democracy, that it's of, by, and for the people, not for uh, wealthy um, individuals or corporations. Uh, and I guess the other thing I'd add to what Peter said is we felt that there was an importance, important to maintain that network of progressive activists rather than having to reinvent it mm -hmm. for every election. That's the way it felt. Every time a, a good candidate came up, we'd say, oh, we need to get involved and support this candidate, and we'd be starting all over from from the bottom. So we wanted to maintain this organization and we've done it as an all-volunteer organization now for, for 15 years. So I, I want to talk about that process, the means if you will, but, but I think it's worth digging a little bit more into those, those issues. I know that uh, you have a background in education, particularly early education. We were talking about the importance of those early years. We're going way, way back, but Head Start mm -hmm. was the 1960s, right? Yep. Um, so there was general enthusiasm and support for, for, for that. Um, where are we on that today, and what, what do we need to do to put that back on the local and state agenda? Yeah. Well, I guess one of the things, of course, Head Start is a national program, and it is critically important. Uh, our focus at PD, Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts, specifically on state and local issues. So obviously we're all concerned about um, uh, federal issues and federal candidates and we get involved those sort of on our own, but our real focus here is in Massachusetts. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the key issue here in Massachusetts is one of financial resources. We are underfunding education, K-12 education. Um, we're certainly underfunding early education. Uh, and a lot of that has to go back to our, our governor. Uh, Governor Baker. And one of the things that uh, Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts is, is involved in right now is putting together a document that we call the Baker Dossier. 
all the reasons that Governor Baker should not be reelected. Yeah. Um, he has a lack of vision for the Commonwealth, whereas Massachusetts has historically been a leader uh, in this country uh, from the days of the Revolution. And um, Governor Baker doesn't have that vision, and he also doesn't have the leadership. Uh, he claims he's a great manager, but if you look at what's been going on over the last three, four years of his um, governorship, uh, there are uh, management failures across state agencies that we read about in the paper day after day, from the state police to the public transportation yeah. system, to our roads and bridges not being maintained, to um, problems with the Department of Revenue. It's just really amazing when you start to dig into it as we have in putting together this dossier. I, I love the term dossier, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had mentioned you've got a website yes. um, where I assume that stuff, one yeah. way in which you uh, disseminate that material. Right. The, the place to find that and a lot of the work from our issues task forces and our candidate endorsements is our website. It's progressivedemsofmass.org. It's all one word, progressivedemsofmass, no, no punctuation, dot org. And it's also a place you can get on our mailing list so mm. we can keep you updated about the work that we're doing and the updates to the dossier and the work around our candidates. The, the education part is important to uh, to me, I'm a Gloucester guy and went through our school system here and had a very good education and went on from there. And um, a lot of my classmates have have done well in lots of different ways. I mean, have led fulfilling lives and been important parts of the community. Beyond education and reminding ourselves, beyond the social justice part of it, and that's a big part of it, mm -hmm. There's, if we're going to have an informed and productive society, people have to be well educated yeah. in a world that's getting ever more complex. But what else is on the agenda? Well, so first of all, a little bit more on education is we, we do have issues working groups on a number of topics, and one of our most active is an education working group, which is partly working on the issues of funding mm -hmm. um, generically, partly working on issues of excessive use of testing, partly working on issues about the vocational education system, which is not serving Massachusetts well. So that's one issue we put a lot of energy into. We've done a lot of work over the years on revenue issues and have advocated for a fairer and more adequate revenue system. We work very closely with the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition, which has been focusing partly on those revenue issues, but also on workers' rights issues, on raising the minimum wage, on providing insured benefits for workers, and have had some big victories there that we're very proud of. We also work on issues of, of campaign finance and um, election access. Um, and making democracy work. We've done work around protecting vulnerable populations. That's one yeah. that we hadn't been focusing on I, prior I, I to Trump's election, but now it's a big focus for us. But I smiled again. I mean, when, you, when, when you'd mentioned of the people, by the people, for the people, that's Abraham Lincoln in 1863, yep. you know? Yep. <laughs> so, so in some ways it almost sounds as if, as if you're trying to evoke the, the values on which the country was based and on which it grew and prospered. That's what we think. I mean, I, you know, obviously politics, there, there's a lot of cyclical variation and we've had a tough time for the last 30 some years of conservative values dominating discourse to an extraordinary degree. I think that we're pushing back on that mm -hmm. and finding ways to revive some of the more traditionally um, progressive views of what government should be, what our relationships to one another should be. But it 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 is a it requires constant effort and it requires real grassroots engagement and bringing people together around these issues. So so help me out a little bit. We've we have a state democratic committee that sort of sits on top of 360 plus city and town committees and so forth. And we see ourselves as dedicated to getting the Democrats who win primaries and so forth elected. Wherever they are on the scale, our view is we're almost inevitably looking at the better choice, even if it isn't necessarily our, our first choice in that regard. The, your Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts group um, is one of a number of grassroots 
organizations out yeah. there. Maybe the maybe the oldest, but how do you coordinate so that you can share best practices yeah. and not have everybody reinventing the, so, the so wheel? So a, a couple of things. First, among progressive organizations, there are some very valuable networks that we're part of. The Raise Up Massachusetts network is an extraordinary coalition that brings people together, that does agenda setting, that does tremendously powerful work. We're also active in Mass Alliance, which is an umbrella organization of about 25 progressive groups, mm -hmm. some with specific issues, women's issues, yeah. environmental issues, some more general groups like ourselves. And we work together to endorse candidates, to again, identify issue priorities. That group has recently um, done a subgroup that we're an active part of that's focusing on district attorney races to try mm -hmm. and improve the criminal justice system. So that's part of it. We also work very closely with democratic city and town mm -hmm. committees, although as I'm sure you're aware, there's immense variation yes. in the activity level and the orientation of those um, town and city committees. Some we've been deeply mm -hmm. connected with, others we find ourselves kind of in opposition to. Mm -hmm. I don't think we take the view that, that you may take that that any Democrat is better than the alternatives. We think well, that I'm just, I'm just <laughs> looking at what the alternatives <laughs> are. Yeah, the, 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 the alternatives there. are bleak, but some of the Democrats in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, People choose to be Democrats because that's the way you get into office. And sometimes there are some Democrats mm -hmm. whose values do not accord very well with what the Democratic platform calls for, what we see mm -hmm. as sort of core progressive values. And part of the reason that we came into existence is many Democratic city and town committees will not take a role in primaries. We want to get involved in primaries to make sure that we can get more progressive candidates running for office and getting elected. You know, and I might add, just uh, we can go back and forth on, on this. I'd be very interested to hear, hear John, about your endorsement process. Mm -hmm. I think our view has been, I'm ready to be persuaded otherwise, but our view is, um, what did Will Rogers say? Uh, I'm not the member of any organized party. I'm a Democrat, right? <laughs> you know, no. And there is a lot of social psychology that talks about small differences. Mm -hmm. um, um, you can have it within religions, and I know whether we're talking about Christianity or Muslim or whatever, where people from both those worlds can sometimes talk together, but they have you know fractious relationships with people that you'd think would be their their kin. And what we've tried to do on the city committee level here is encourage people to get deeply involved if there's a, ca a candidate they're, they're passionate for. And we don't want to seem to be in the position of squashing somebody who might be an outlier, mm -hmm. might not have majority support. And then when there's a primary, you know, we move forward and hope that we can work together. But how do you do, John, how do you endorse and avoid pleasing some people and alienating others where there is a common commitment to the agenda that you're talking right. about. Yeah, that always is a challenge. We work very closely with the Mass Alliance, which Peter just mentioned, uh, where they, they vet with a very uh, lengthy questionnaire candidates, particularly for the state legislature, and we often piggyback on their endorsements. We do try and focus our endorsements in areas where we feel we can have an impact. Uh, we are a small organization, we all are volunteers, so we uh, do selective endorsements and then really try and support those candidates both with financial support and with doing the kind of grassroots things that we talked about in terms of going out and helping them knock on doors and so forth. And this it, is this is pre-nomination, correct? Yes. Yep. 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 It may be worth saying a few words about the gubernatorial race, which is a mm. particularly complex yeah. <laughs> one. Mass Alliance does not get involved, so we have developed our own process for the gubernatorial races in the last few cycles. And what we have typically, what we've done is interviews with each of the candidates mm -hmm. very early mm -hmm. on to get some sense, sharing that information with our membership. And then in each of the last two cycles, we've then held a forum at which we invited each of the candidates to come and we got a panel of experts on what we thought were some key issues. We did an hour long interview with each of the candidates where we really pushed yeah. them fairly hard on not only what their views were, but how they would move their agendas forward. And 
had a, a, a large body of our sustaining members and other interested people at those forums, and then on the basis of that did um, an endorsement process. This year we've endorsed Jay Gonzalez on the basis of that process. And by the way, those interviews with, it's actually with the three candidates who were in the race at mm -hmm. that time, are all up on our website mm -hmm. and are fascinating to watch if people yeah. are interested. Yeah. So, so Jay, if I can use a first name here, not that I'm tight with him, has a lot of support here on Cape Ann and in Gloucester. But there are still some people who are, you know, um, pleased to have two good options mm -hmm. or whatever. But um, as a committee, we haven't taken action on that. What we do is we invite people in, and mm -hmm. they do come. And we have well-attended uh, city committee meetings on a monthly basis, so we get to hear people. And um, I think because Catherine Bayless gets a lot of credit for this some years years ago. We've got such an active group, um, people want to come and talk to us because mm -hmm. we can get people yeah. out knocking on doors. Yeah. Do you do any recruiting? Do you, do you, well, do you, can I go back just please. in terms of our endorsement process? We have a group, uh, we have a, a broad group of members, I think it's what, 1,300 who are on our email list mm -hmm. and have come to our website and said, I want to be part of this. We have a much smaller group of what we call sustaining members who have made a financial uh, commitment to the organization. We ask for $10 a month, mm -hmm. and those sustaining members vote on our endorsements. And we require a two-thirds threshold to I endorse see. candidates. I see. So, you, so if you had a 60-40, then you're going to... We would not yeah, endorse. Yeah, yeah not because you're concerned about the 40. Yeah. That they, they, right, they're making exactly. a judgment. So. And, and if your question was about recruitment of candidates, actually, we haven't sort of deliberately gone out to recruit people as candidates. What we have had is people who have come up through our ranks and been involved through mm -hmm. our process who have then decided to run quite a few for local offices, but um, Mary Keefe, who is a state representative from Worcester, was one of our founding members and mm -hmm. really got our origins with us. Oh. And then this year, there are two other of our longtime activists who are running for first time to fill vacant seats in the legislature. So I, I think th that is part of what's, it wasn't a deliberate part yeah. of our plan, but it's part of what happens when you get people involved and help them build skills and help them feel the value of being active and involved. And so, so I'd also add that we are, we do have local chapters and we're exploring how those can work and building those. So for instance, in the area where I am in Reading, we have a state rep district that uh, crosses Reading, North Reading, and Linfield. And I've been involved in putting together sort of a local PDM chapter there mm -hmm. of primarily people from the town committees in those three towns. And we are looking at recruiting a candidate to run against the Republican mm -hmm. uh, representative who's held that seat for um, almost 20 years now, 15 years at least, and has had no opposition mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. So we'd love to have a good, strong, progressive Democrat to at least vote for, uh, even though it's a tough race to, uh, to win. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I know that Seth Moulton has worked hard to get people mm -hmm. who've done public service, principally in the military, but they'd welcome people who are doing Teach for America. And there, then there are some women's groups who have recruited women to run for office, which is refreshing. I would assume that if you were to come to people with your potential of endorsing and so forth, you've solved one of their problems, which is how do I get in the door? Yeah. Now, well, Mass Alliance, who is this umbrella group, does superb trainings and development. So for people who are interested in running for office, we generally send them to the Mass Alliance trainings and they get very good support through you know, that umbrella organization too. So we've talked about a bunch of things, um, um, and I, I've obviously engaged in this. We talked about education. We at least uh, pointed out the importance of uh, democratic values in terms of the voting access and so right. forth, economic justice. But what about money in politics? Um, I'm thinking of the Bernie campaign, this, this averages and so forth, but his average donation was 27 bucks, yeah. as I recall. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about um, state and local elections, uh, I see what it costs to run for mayor of Gloucester nowadays. When I was a kid growing up, that wasn't the case. This is old guy talk, right? Yeah. You know. So, so I'm wondering whether there's a, a way of being. I'll use the word subversive. You know, to just do an end run on on the money thing through activism, through 
enlisting people with small donations and so forth. Uh -huh. um, what, what do you do to try to deal with the fact that um, there are big bankrolls behind some establishment candidates, I suppose, on both sides of, of the aisle? How do you get around that? Well, one thing... <laughs> you both look at yeah, each other. Where, where's the answer? <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of points there. One of the starting points is we are also part of the We the People Coalition, which is working um, to get the legislature to pass uh, resolutions calling for a constitutional, U.S. constitutional amendment to overturn the Citizens United mm -hmm. decision that's allowed huge amounts of money and, uh, and, dark, and, money. and dark money, where we don't know who the donors are, um, into our elections. Uh, one of the discussions we've had at PDM that uh, I hope we'll have a discussion with some of our candidates that we succeed in electing this fall is whether we should think about uh, reviving the effort to have clean elections here in Massachusetts, where we have public funds that match small private donations. They do this in New York City very successfully. They're doing it in Maine. In New York City, the um, public funds actually match small private donations six to one, six dollars for every dollar on a small private donation. That's had a real how, impact how in New York City. How long has that been going on, John? Um, Very it, recent. It's, it's four or five years, yeah, I think, uh -huh. now. And that's municipal. It's in New municipal York City. Municipal in New so. York City, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But Maine has a public financing. I think Arizona, Arizona does, does as well. And a few oh. other states for some offices and not for other yeah. offices. It, 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 but Massachusetts had a very nice clean elections law that we passed by initiative but that the legislature never implemented mm. and ultimately repealed. And, and it may be time to come back to that. The other thing I think that, that, that we think we're doing is substituting activism for some of the money. Mm -hmm. And in local races, they still do require money. But I, I'm one of the races that we're very active in this year um, in replacing Jay Kaufman, who is the Lexington, mm. Lexington and Woburn representative, um, it's a seat that should be a very progressive seat. There mm -hmm. are a number of candidates. We are supporting one of our mm -hmm. PDM homebred women, Marianne yeah. Stewart, and she's running against somebody who has very deep pockets and very extensive resources. And we're doing some help raising funds for her, but we're also providing shoe leather. Yeah. Um, and it's easier to provide shoe leather than to match money sometimes. Well, that's, that's what I was wondering about. There's a certain point where um, we all get the robocalls and um, I can maybe wistfully wish that well, that would just sort of yeah. become yesterday's news. It's, we, we believe locally in our, it's person-to-person -person engagement, yep. Yep. it's enlistment. The, and the data way. supports that overwhelmingly. Yeah. And, and turnout is so key. Getting mm -hmm. people to vote. Many people don't realize that Governor Baker in getting elected got fewer votes than Donald Trump did in losing mm -hmm. to Hillary Clinton in Massachusetts. If we could get anywhere near the kind of turnout we get in Massachusetts in a presidential election, Charlie ba Governor Baker would almost certainly lose just because of the, dem the demographics and, and political leanings of the turnout in Massachusetts. Yeah, and particularly if we read the dossier and see what, what he has uh, not done, and it's a. It's, I hope there's a short version of it because I would say it's a long, it's a long list, and everybody, oh, what, what a nice well, guy, but what has he accomplished? Yeah. Well, we there is a two-page overview that's on the website, in addition to the full document, which I think I mentioned is 23 pages mm -hmm. and growing. Every two weeks, we're putting out a topical release. So the first one we did was on transportation, then we did one on gun violence prevention, then we did one on the state police scandals and other criminal justice issues. Uh, and the most recent one was on energy and the environment. The one we're going to do in the next week or two is on education, which we've talked about yeah. here. Uh, and when you look at those issues, it, both in terms of what he's done, what Governor Baker has done, and what he hasn't done, uh, both of it uh, argue strongly that we need to have a different governor. From the fact that, you know, transportation-wise, our roads are jammed. Yes. Congres congestion is growing. Uh, Massachusetts drivers are spending more time stuck in traffic every year, and he has no plan to address it. Our roads and bridges are crumbling, and not only does he have a plan to address that, but he opposed the indexing of the gas tax to inflation, which would have provided some money to address the issues with our roads and bridges. And we all know about the public transportation and the T, but um, we, we, were, <laughs> we were talking earlier, Peter, you were in the Dukakis administration. I was. And I heard him on the radio uh, on GBH last week still vital and passionate and so forth. Apparently at 5 p.m., it's not a problem for us on the North Shore. We have our own Route 1 problems. 
But in the Southeast Expressway at 5 p.m., the speed is 10 miles an hour. In three years, it's going to be at 5 p.m., it's going to be uh, six. In 10 years, it's going to be three. And um, that's just a chokehold on the economy. It's environmentally disastrous when you're running running a gasoline engine and not making any progress. And there and are he's good done, alternatives. Yeah, he's, he's done nothing on, yeah. on that. But can we, can we go back to the turnout point? As you're trying to mobilize people who at some level are impacted by the issues that we're talking about, whether it's education for their kids, whether it's health, whether it's any of these other kinds of things, whose interests would be advanced mm -hmm. if they went to the voting polls but they don't. What's your view of the inertia, what it is that uh, is keeping yeah. people from, from getting out and voting in their interest? Yeah, there have been some interesting studies of how people think about politics and how they think about government. And the, the prevalent image of government right now is two politicians screaming at each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. and. I think it has led to a tremendous level of alienation. People see politics as something that is not in their control and as something that is badly broken. Mm -hmm. And part of what our message is, is we need to bring politics back to something that is our voices mm -hmm. speaking and our engagement. That's a slow process. I mean, there are some people who are take to very naturally Showing that to others, helping others feel comfortable with that is the hard work. And knocking the doors, talking to people, taking the time to get to know people, to hear what their real concerns are, to connect those to what's going on in government is, I think, what we see as the way to try and move that forward. But it's, it's, a, it's a long, slow process. So, the, you know, the time has flown here. We have less than a minute here. Probably makes sense to uh, repeat the website uh, URL. It is it's progressivedemsofmass.org. All one word, no punctuation. The other thing I would add is that getting out there on the local level, talking to people you know, talking about local issues like education. We need our government to support our education system, and that requires funding and resources to do it. And we have information on all our issues, our Baker dossier at that website, progressive ma progressivedemsofmass.org. Mm -hmm. Well, when we sat down, I told you, um, you know, I'm still at it, but um, um, we live in very challenging times, to put it, put it politely. Um, talking with you two this morning um, has been really gratifying and inspiring, and I hope that those who've tuned in today uh, feel the same way. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank Our you. pleasure.